Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Armourer's Bench. In 1940, following the evacuation from Dunkirk, the British Army was in a desperate need for small arms, with over 100,000 rifles left behind in France. In dire need of rifles, Britain turned to the US and its huge industrial base, and approached a number of companies about tooling up and producing the Lee Enfield Rifle No. 4. Savage Arms took on one contract and projected production of around a thousand rifles per day. But establishing the production of a rifle the US companies didn't have the tooling or gauges for would take time. Remington were also approached by the British Purchasing Commission and asked if they could manufacture up to 400,000 rifles. Remington estimated that it would take up to 30 months to tool up for number four production. However, Remington believed that if they could lease the old tooling previously used at the Rock Island Arsenal to produce M1903s, they could tool up to produce the M1903 in just 12 months. It was suggested that the tooling be adapted to produce the rifles chambered in the British .303 cartridge. Some ergonomic changes could also be made so that the rifles mimicked the British No. 4. On December 12, 1940, the British government issued a letter of intent to Remington for the manufacture of 500,000 rifles in 303. Some sources suggest the British agreed on an advance payment of $4 million. Much of this went towards covering the lease, transport and refurbishment of the M1903 tooling. The rest went on the purchase of raw materials and the necessary accessories for the half a million rifles. The tooling lease was agreed in March 1941 and the US government also supplied 600,000 stock blanks which had been in storage in exchange for ammunition produced by Remington. With the passage of the Lend-Lease Act on the 11th of March, the Remington contract came under the control of the US government rather than being a private affair. Remington received the last tooling shipments from the Rock Island Arsenal on the 22nd of April and by the end of May had the production line set up. A contract to produce the hybrid rifles at a cost of $5 per rifle was agreed in late June. Remington's engineers began setting up the equipment and working out an ad hoc production layout that would allow a thousand rifles plus to be built per day. At least four pilot models were built, with some of these guns being sent to Britain. These prototype rifles were reportedly received in September 1941 and following preliminary examination were described as very successful. Four of these rifles were distributed for further testing but by the end of 1941 the project had been abandoned. Let's take a closer look at the rifle and the changes that were made to the 1903 to meet British requirements. Remington made a number of external and internal changes to approximate the British Army's rifle number four. They fitted a front sight post with sight protectors, which was moved further back from the muzzle to enable the rifle to mount the number four's spike bayonet. As such, the upper barrel band no longer has the 1903's bayonet look, Many of the parts are still in the white, unfinished, including the barrel, barrel bands, floor plate, front sight assembly, rear sight assembly, and the bolt itself. The bolt does, however, have a parkerized cocking piece. The hybrid also moves the rear sight back onto the receiver, which necessitates a longer piece of wooden furniture covering where the 1903's ladder sight would have been. The style of rear sight was also changed to a two-position flip sight with apertures for 300 and 600 yards, mimicking those seen on the rifle number four Mark II. Remington also redesigned the charger guide to support the chargers used by the Lee Enfield, rather than the stripper clips of the M1903. The bolt was adapted to work with Britain's rimmed 303 round, with the extractor modified for the British cartridge's wider and thicker rim, and the barrels were reamed for 303 rather than 30 odd six. The rifle did not have the Lee Enfield's detachable box magazine, instead retaining the 1903's five round internal magazine. The rifle's stock has been adapted, so instead of a straight wristed stock, a piece of wood has been spliced to create a Lee Enfield style contour. The stock is marked with the inspector marks WJS, which indicate the stock was originally inspected by WJ Strong, accepted sometime between 1918 and 1921 as well as a pair of later Springfield Armoury inspection cartouches, SPG, the initials of Stanley P. Gibbs, who was an inspector at Springfield between 1936 and 1942, as well as GHS, 
the initials for Brigadier General Gilbert H. Stuart, Springfield's commander, in the late 1930s and early 40s. This would suggest that the stock was refurbished at Springfield Armoury, before being transferred to Remington, where it was subsequently adapted. In August 1941, the US began its own rearmament programme. At the same time, Number 4 production had gotten underway in Canada, and at Savage in the US. And it was decided that Remington's Hybrid 303 was no longer needed. The hybrid contract was formally cancelled in December 1941, and additional 30-odd-6 M1903s and M1917s were taken under the Lend-Lease Agreement instead, to fulfil the needs of Britain's Home Guard. Savage believed they could significantly increase the number of rifles they could build per day, and they managed to enter production by the end of 1941, and by 1944 they produced well over 1 million number 4s. Remington went on to produce 1903s for the US military, overcoming issues with the original engineering drawings, and the tooling dimensions to eventually produce 365,000 M1903s by mid-1943, before switching to the M1903A3 pattern and producing a further 707,629 rifles. During the war, in total, Remington produced an impressive 1,084,079 M1903 pattern rifles. With only a handful built, the Remington 303 hybrids are perhaps the rarest M1903 variant. They would have likely been perfectly serviceable rifles and helped plug the desperate gap in Britain's arsenal. But rapidly moving events ensured that these rifles became a footnote in the histories of both the Lee Enfield and the Springfield 1903. Special thanks to both Remington and the Cody Firearms Museum for allowing us to take a look at this extremely rare rifle. Thanks to you guys for watching, hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and if you'd like to you can support us over on Patreon or via coffee.com with a one-time donation. Thanks again for watching, I'll see you in the next one.